multiple sets of glowing eyes pierced the darkness. Matt knew this was the end. Nowhere to run, no way to defend himself. The dogmen started to yip and growl in anticipation of the kill. They moved in closer and closer. The Alpha moved in a flash. Matt felt nothing. The last registering sight was the dogman ripping his and Dale's bodies apart as they consumed their flesh. Then white, then nothingness. The Alpha let out a bellowing howl and the rest of the pack joined in. This was a warning call. Stay away. Three months later, I don't care that fish and wildlife can't find him. Aaron screams into her phone. I know he didn't just fucking disappear into thin air. Ma'am, calm down, please. The voice on the other end of the line calmly said. We are doing everything we can to locate your fiancé. According to our records, we've searched every inch of the area where Mr. Lindale and Dale Cunnings were hunting, and we haven't been able to locate either of the two men. Why not? Aaron said. You have dogs and manpower. What is the issue? Aaron continued to scream through the phone. Ma'am, I will not tolerate you screaming at me. I am doing everything. I've done everything I can to assist you. The man on the phone said. A tear fell from Aaron's face as she hung up the phone. These people don't know anything, she shouted. Aaron, relax. You know, screaming and cursing at these people never helps, says Lisa, Dale's girlfriend. Aaron sits on the couch next to her friend. I know, Lisa. I'm just so sick of no news about Matt and Dale. Are they lost? Hurt? Did they die? I know, sweetie. Lisa says. The doorbell sounds. Who the hell is that? Aaron says as she stands and starts walking to the door. Lisa jumps up and looks out of the window. She sees a black SUV and two men in black camel fatigues. Aaron, Lisa says. There's... Just then, Aaron opens the door and is greeted by two men in the same black camo fatigues as their colleagues stand next to the SUV outside. Can I help you? Aaron says. Lisa joins her at the door. Hello, ladies. I'm Greg Stone, and this gentleman to my right is Peter King. We are with a branch of the government that handles delicate situations. Okay, Lisa says. Our superiors believe that Mr. Matt Lindale and Mr. Dale Cunnings were victims of an attack by what we call Big Black Dogs, Stone said in a serious voice. Aaron and Lisa both stare intently at the two gentlemen. Okay, Lisa says. Do you mean a literal Big Black Dog? If that's the case, Aaron chimes in. Then wouldn't there be blood or bodies? Not to mention, I think our men can handle a big dog, Aaron says sarcastically. Well, Stone starts to speak, then he's immediately cut off by Lisa. I'm sorry, but do you have a badge or some form of ID? Sure. Stone and King show the two women their credentials. Okay. Lisa says, we already spoke with the ATF, FBI, and CIA. So what are the local area police going to do that they haven't done already? We are a subdivision of a different government agency, Stone says. Meaning what? Lisa says, did the guys get caught up in some type of drug farming or kidnapping? No, King says. Ladies, have you ever seen an animal like this? Kin holds up a sketch of a dogman. Yes, 
In any werewolf movie that I've ever seen, Aaron says. Lisa stares a bit at the sketch, then says, Are you trying to tell us that our guys were attacked by a goddamn werewolf? That's ridiculous, Lisa says in a heightened tone. Well, Stone says. Just then, King's phone rings. King here. Yes, sir. We are with them now. No, sir. Very good, sir. King hangs up his cell phone as he looks at Stone. The team is en route, King says. Stone gives King a slight nod. The two women swap glances at each other. I apologize, ladies. We must get going. Wait, Aaron exclaims. What the hell was that? Who was on the phone? What team? Where are they going? We need some goddamn answers. Aaron yells, tears of pain and anger filling her eyes. You come in here and show us a picture of a werewolf and say our guys may have been attacked by a big dog. Lisa yells as the two men are walking through the door. King turns and says, We received word that our tech crew was able to ping your fiancé's GPS. We are sending a team in to investigate. Once we know more, someone will be in contact. Have a great day, ladies. Aaron and Lisa look at each other confused. But, wait a second, the women say at the same time in irritated tones. We will be in touch, ladies. Thank you for your time, Stone sternly says. Stone and King exit the residence and quickly walk to the SUV. They enter the vehicle, followed by the other two men. So it's happening, one of the other men said. Yes, Jones, it's on. The boys are en route now. Yes. I hope our boys put a hurting on these vicious fucks. The black SUV quickly pulls away. Lisa and Aaron are standing on the porch steps, yelling obscenities at the SUV as it pulls away. What was that girl? Says Aaron. I don't know him. But we need to look into this a bit more. Lisa remarks. The two women start to research Big Black Dog on the internet as they discuss what just took place. The two women come across a YouTube channel that is dedicated to allegedly true werewolf stories. The two friends spend the next few hours listening and watching the videos. Lisa then finds a picture from a trail camera. It's a photo of a dog man. Under the photo, the words read, Big Black Dog. The two women stare in horror at the computer screen. Her ears twitch. She hears a loud rumbling sound coming. She was just rolling around in the soft grass, her chestnut fur blowing softly in the breeze. She stands to her eight-foot height as she flicks her ears and sniffs the air. She can hear something making its way in her direction. She moves from her position in the clearing, heading towards the rumbling sound. She just comes over the ridge and sees it. A machine. She knows that machines mean humans. She lets out a low growl at the sight. There are tall trees all around her, perfect for cover. She crouches down as she watches the machine. The machine stops and she observes two men exit the vehicle. Both men, dressed in black and carrying M4s with pistols on their sides, wearing tactical equipment and backpacks on their backs. Another man jumps out of the driver's side door. He was a larger man, taller than the other two by at least a foot. He was wearing a black tank top and black camo pants carrying a 12-gauge pump shotgun with a smoking cigar hanging from his mouth. She stares at the men, her icy blue eyes narrowed as she picked up the scent of the larger man. He smelled like urine and smoke. She could hear the larger man yelling at the other two men. Wait, 
What is that? Movement in the trees behind the humans. She sees one of her packs circling around the side of the humans. This one was curious. He was only six feet tall, a slender toned body, fast and agile for a young one, just like her own pup. She watched as the black furred young one slowly moved closer to the men. Suddenly, he stopped as another machine pulls up behind the first. Four more men exit this machine, all in the same gear as the first two men she watched exiting the first machine. One man starts yelling. She sees him raise his weapon in the direction of the young one. She lets out a howl. A distraction, so that the young one can escape the area. She sees all seven of the men look in her direction. The large human takes a few steps forward. She could see the young one sink back into the darkness of the forest. She is satisfied that the young one is no longer in danger. She lets out another howl. This howl is a warning call that intruders are here. Harold, get over here. Davidson orders. Yes, sir. I don't want to hear your goddamn complaining at all. Not at fucking all. Davidson yells as spit flies from his mouth. Davidson is a large man. He is a veteran of the United States Armed Services. That was a good 25 years ago, and life has taken its toll on him. The brass expects us to find two nobodies out here and bring them home to their women, Davidson says. You heard that howl, Edward says. Plus, Chinny swore he saw one in the trees. Ain't that right, Chinny? You got it, Cupcake, Chinny remarked. Good one. O'Neill said with a smirk on his face. All I'm saying is that they're out here, Edwards replied. Those two men that came out this way didn't make it. They'd been missing for three months. Shut the fuck up, Davidson screeched. Our job is to hike to the location of the GPS and search for Matt Lindale and Dale Cunnings. If we run into anything else, we will deal with it accordingly. That means you gotta fuck it, Harold, Ginny remarked. The team laughed. <laughs> Shut up, you shit stains, Davidson screamed. Let's move out. The team checks their gear. You can hear snapping of clips, magazines being checked and inserted into the guns. The team is bullshitting amongst themselves as they squad up to move out. The team begins hiking through the forest towards the last known location of the GPS. The hike is long, about five miles from their location. No roads to drive on. They are out in the middle of nowhere. Tall oak, maple, and birch trees surround them, along with thorn bushes, long grass, bushes and rocks everywhere. The men have been walking for about three and a half hours now. The men are making slick comments back and forth between themselves as they walk in a single file line. O'Neill is taking up the rear, keeping a sharp eye out while Davidson is leading the team through the woods towards the GPS location. Chinny and Harold are walking behind Davidson as they normally did on operations. All right, gents, enough of the chit-chat. Davidson pipes up. We are about a mile away from the last known location of the GPS. Chinny, take Gonzo and scout ahead. Copy that, Chinny responds. Gonzo, let's move. On your six, said Gonzo. Here, take this, Davidson says as he hands the locator to Gonzo. Gonzo clips the locator to his wristband, and the two men move ahead of the remaining five men. She has been following the men since the sun was high in the sky. These humans move slowly, she thinks, as she moves from tree to tree, completely silent. She wants to rip them apart. However, 
she will wait and study them as she is, in no danger. She is an efficient killer. Her chestnut fur is a beautiful camo inside the dense forest. She stops a bit ahead of the group of humans. Disgusting creatures, she thinks as she peers around the big maple tree. Her long, sharp claws dig into the tree trunk. Two of the creatures move ahead of the others. She looks between the two men and the other five as they move further apart. They separated, she thinks. Suddenly, she smells a familiar smell. She looks behind her as he comes towards her. An eight-foot charcoal black dogman with broad shoulders and chest, a slender midsection and big strong canine legs. It's one of her pack. He has answered her call. He steps towards her. She snuggles her muzzle against his neck. He lets out a low groan. He observes the human standing in the forest and lets out a deep, low growl. She points in the direction of the other two humans, and the black dogman bows his head as he lets out a humph. She takes off quickly towards the other two humans as he stays to observe the five remaining creatures. He watches her until she is out of sight. He has always protected her ever since they were pups. He turns his attention back to the five men and takes a deep sniff in. He smells the cigar smoke, beef jerky in the large man's pocket, sweat and that savory smell of fear. He studies the creature's clothing and weapons. He humps as he moves to all fours and slowly creeps towards the humans. He despises them. He hears a crack, followed by another crack, then multiple cracks. The wind carried the odor of blood. Human blood. There was another smell. It was one of his kind. He fights the urge to run to her aid. His lips curl back as he lets out a low growl. He salivates at the thought of consuming human flesh. He focuses back on the other humans. His bright amber eyes narrow. A sinister smile creeps over his face. Gonzo, how much further to the GPS location? Not far, Chinny. About 30 yards ahead. Hold up, Gonzo says. There, 20 yards out, I see a truck. Let's move in, says Chimmy. Chimmy and Gonzo move in towards the banged up truck. The truck had deep scratches over the hood, along the doors and quarter panels, and the tires were shredded. You smell that? Chimmy said. Yeah, I do. It smells like someone dumped 50 gallons of piss around here, Gonzo replied. Wait, what's that? Gonzo said, down the hill. On me, said Gonzo. Another truck. Jimmy clicks his radio. Davidson, come in. Over. Jimmy, update. Over, replied Davidson. We found one truck on a small path. There's another down a steep hill. We are moving to assess. Gonzo had moved further down the hill. He yells back to Chinny. Chinny. Get your ass down here. Davidson, we found the other truck belonging to Dale Cunnings. Investigating further. We'll update shortly. Over. Copy that, Davidson replied. Chimney moved to Gonzo's position. Holy shit. What the fuck happened here? I don't know, Chin. This truck is smashed to shit. There's tracks everywhere. Not to mention the smell of rotten meat and urine, said Gonzo. Gonzo knelt down to look through the truck. Did you hear that? Chimmy says as he raises his M4. Hear what? Those voices messing with you again, said Gonzo sarcastically. Fuck you, dude. Seriously, something is out there. Gonzo backs out of the truck as the two men scan their surroundings. Everything is silent. An eerie feeling comes over the two men. Holy shit. Contact, contact, Gonzo says 
as he raises his M4. He gets off a shot as he is tackled by a black mass with razor-sharp claws digging into his sides. Gonzo screams in agony. Chimmy unloads as he sees Gonzo hit the ground with a six-foot dogman, with bright red eyes sinking its fangs into Gonzo's neck. The beast shook his head back and forth violently, ripping flesh away from Gonzo's upper torso. His neck is mangled, blood, tissue, and bone fly from the young ones more as he snarls and fixes his gaze on the other human. Gonzo! Chimmy screams as he squeezes the trigger on his M4, letting bullets fly towards the beast. The dogman yelps as he is hit with the fiery lead. He jumps quickly over the damaged vehicle and dashes through the trees up the hill, breathing heavily, bullets in hot pursuit. Chimmy quickly runs to his friend's side. Gonzo! Gonzo! Davidson's voice comes over the walkie. Chimmy, Gonzo, what the fuck is going on? The fucking thing. It, it attacked us. It ripped Gonzo's throat out. It killed my friend. Chimmy screams frantically into the radio. We're heading your way, son. Stay put. Davidson ordered. Chimmy didn't respond. His eyes filled with tears. Suddenly, he hears a loud, guttural growl coming from behind him. A small gurgle escapes his lips. He looks down to see a huge, blood-stained, clawed hand sticking from his stomach. He coughs as blood pours from his mouth. A huge moor filled with razor-sharp fangs crunches down onto his neck and shoulder. He tries to scream, but chokes on his blood. His body feels numb as he drops down to his knees. She ripped away part of the man's shoulder and neck, swallowing the human's flesh as she was pulling her huge clawed hand from his now lifeless corpse. The corpse fell in front of her as she took a giant step towards the other creature's corpse. She sniffs the human's mangled body the air around her thick with the smell of blood. She takes another deep sniff in and listens closely. Where did he go? There, up the hill. She hears heavy panting and small whimpers. She quickly makes her way up the hill. She finds the young one laying under a tall maple tree, his red eyes dimmed, his tongue hanging from his moor, his once black fur now stained red. She stands to her eight-foot height as she looks at the young one. He sees her icy blue eyes looking back at him, filled with sadness. She moves closer to him. She can smell the fear on the young one. This bothered her. She couldn't bear to see the young one suffer. His eyes begin to close. In one quick motion, she slashes the young one's throat with her dagger-like claws. A huge gash opens in the young one's neck. Blood flows, and she throws back her massive head and howls. His ears twitch at the sound of the howl. His amber eyes widen as he listens to the drawn-out howl. He knows this call. It is one of sadness. He joins in with her as he feels her pain. He brings his head down as he feels the rage building inside of him. His loved one's hurt. Her friend is gone. He looks at the men moving through the forest in her direction and lets out an ear-shattering roar. The men turn in his direction, raising their weapons. Snaps, zips, and bark breaking off of the trees. A bullet grazes his ear. He turns and dashes through the woods, his claws sinking into the ground as he turns on a dime and blows past a giant boulder. He is heading towards his pack. These intruders must pay. Holy shit, boys. Those howls are terrifying, Harold says. No, says O'Neill. The howls are sad dipshits. Chini and Gonzo must have got one of them, Edward said in an excited tone. One of them is really close, 
said Reed, as he scanned the trees in the direction of the howl. A core shaking roar erupted. The four men raised their weapons and let loose a barrage of bullets in the direction. Davidson yelling, cease fire, cease fire you fucking morons. You're shooting at nothing you dumbasses, stop fucking firing. The men stop. Jesus Christ, what the fuck? Davidson scolds. You hear a roar and piss yourselves. Harold, shaking rapidly, says, did you not hear that? It sounded like it came from 20 feet out. Whatever it was, took off when we started shooting, said O'Neill. Edwards, read. Go see if you can track that thing, Davidson ordered. O'Neill, Harold, on me. We're heading towards Chimmy and Gonzo's last position. The men head their separate ways. Edwards and Reed pick up the trail of the dogmen. Huge tracks lead northwest. They follow cautiously, but with urgency in their steps. Davidson, Harold, and O'Neill come up on the first of the damaged vehicles. O'Neill takes point and searches the truck, and he finds a picture of a beautiful woman with green eyes, long, reddish-colored hair, and a bright smile. Wow, look at this hottie, O'Neill said. Harold takes the photo. This is Erin Lance. She is Matt Lindale's fiance. Wow, she's beautiful. Gentlemen, look down there, about 20 feet out. Oh, shit. There go our boys, Davidson says. Down the hill, the men slowly approach the two mangled corpses, blood pooling under the bodies, intestines pouring from Chinny's body, and flies starting to buzz. Oh my god, Harold says, as he bends over and lets go of his earlier breakfast. O'Neill bends down next to the bodies. He removes their IDs and personal belongings that say anything about who they are. Davidson breaks the silence. All right, boys, collect their sidearms, MREs, and any ammunition they have. Harold, sweep the area. See if there's any sign of Matt Lindale and Dale Cunnings. O'Neill, see if you can pick up the trail of the beasts that did this. Davidson, I found something, says Harold. See these gouges in the trees? They must have been made by something huge, Harold said in a trembling voice. Davidson inspects the gouges in the trees. They're deep, four of them. Davidson's eyes widened in terror. He snaps out when he hears O'Neill's voice. Over here, boss. You gotta see this. Davidson walks over to O'Neill's location. In a shaken voice, Davidson says, O'Neill, what do you got? O'Neill's eyes filled with terror and fear. He lifts his hand. Davidson looks at O'Neill. Is that, uh, O'Neill cuts him off. It is, Davidson, a piece of a human skull. My bet is that it belongs to one of those men we're out here for. Jesus, Davidson says. We need to get these damn things. Harold, report. What else have you found? Harold, where are you? O'Neill stands up and looks around. Harold, where the fuck are you? She hears a gasp. She snaps her head in the direction of the sound. A human. How did it sneak up on her? She wasn't paying attention. She smells fear pouring from the human. The human pointing his weapon in her direction. Her icy blue eyes narrow, and she digs her long, sharp claws into the forest floor as she stares the human down. Her lips curl back as she lets out a low growl. She lowers her head. The human is shaking violently. Her ears twitch as the creature's finger begins to move and she bursts forward with incredible speed. Harold's eyes widened. He touches the trigger on the M4. Harold drops his weapon. 
he sees his intestines spilling from his stomach. The chestnut dogman is standing in front of him. He drops to his knees. Harold hears a deep, guttural growl from his left side. He looks in the direction. A huge, 11-foot gray and red dogman snarling in his face. Seven-inch teeth and breath with the smell of rotten meat. Harold looks up further past the muzzle of this massive creature. Glowing amber eyes piercing his soul. Harold's eyes fill with tears. The Alpha grabs Harold by his head. Harold screams in agony as he feels the Alpha's monstrous grip tightening. The Alpha opens his giant moor. Slowly, he sinks his fangs into Harold's skull. Harold's skull cracks under the pressure of the Alpha's jaws. Blood, brain, and skull fragments flow down the giant beast as he crunches down. Harold's skull shatters into pieces. Harold's headless body falls to the ground. She looks at her Alpha as he stands to his full, massive, 11-foot height. She bows her head, showing her appreciation for his aid. He lets out a growl. Two 10-foot, barrel-chested dogmen step out of the trees. The first is black, like a midnight sky, and the other has reddish fur with patches of white, both with orange eyes. The midnight black dogman grabs Harold's headless corpse and carries it back into the trees as the other picks up the young one's body. Then he heads in the direction of the other. The black dogman comes around her side and nuzzles his muzzle against her cheek. The Alpha sniffs in deeply, and he lets out a low growl. More intruders need to be dealt with. Where the fuck is this shit stain? Davidson snaps. He can't be far, said O'Neill. Edwards, Reed. Come in. Over. Yes, sir. Over. Answered Reed. What's your twenty? Davidson barked. We are on top of a small ridge, looking over the river to the north. Over, replied Edwards. We need to regroup immediately, Davidson said. Sir, we are on this fucker. Odds are he is seeking shelter. About 75 yards past the waterfall, there looks to be an alcove. We are going to check it out. No, Davidson screamed. We have two KIA, Chinny and Gonzo, and Harold is currently missing. We need to regroup now. That's an order. Shit, sir. Edwards exclaimed. Sir, that's some fuckery. Answered Reed. We need to get this bastard. We're so close. Reed chirped back. Davidson paused before answering. Sir, said O'Neill, Reed and Edwards are right. That alcove may lead to a cave which may be their den. If we can flush them out of there, we will be able to ambush them, and then we can get home and receive the rest of our payday. Davidson looked at O'Neill. He smiled at the thought of that paycheck. Fine, Davidson grumbled. Reed, Edwards, hold your positions. O'Neill and I are moving to your position. Over. Copy that, sir. Over and out. Do we go look for Harold, sir? O'Neill questions. No, he wandered off. Probably couldn't deal with these abominations. But sir, Davidson steps in front of O'Neill. If you want to go look for Harold, be my fucking guest. If you die or get lost, that's just more money for me, Davidson says with an evil smile. O'Neill stares into Davidson's eyes. Unfortunately, I need that money, or we would be having a different conversation. Good. Let's go. The sun falls from the sky. The moon and stars light up the night sky, and the forest is silent. The smell of blood and fear is in the wind. 
The black dogman and his mate are watching over the four men silently from atop a tall oak tree. The men have been arguing amongst themselves for a while now. The mated pair looks higher above the waterfall. They can see their alpha crouching in the moonlight. He is strong. They think of their two fallen companions, the brothers. They were also strong, just like their father, the Alpha. The black-furred brother was a force to be reckoned with. Light on his feet for his massive size. A strong, intelligent, vicious killer. However, he made a mistake. He played with the two humans. He should have finished them quickly. Suddenly, multiple gunshots fill the air. They look to where the humans are, flashes lighting up the area. A loud roar and screams of horror. The mates watch the humans scatter. Why in the fuck would we risk going inside that cave in close quarters? Those things would rip us apart in no time, O'Neill exclaimed. There may be more in the forest around us. What happens if we go in then? Another comes from behind. Then we'd be trapped. No way. I'm with O'Neill, said Reed. You are all a bunch of bitch asses, said Davidson. Edwards chimed in. Sir, O'Neill and Reed are right. There's no way we should be going into that fucking cave. No fucking way. God damn it. You no good cowards. This is the biggest payday of our lives. We will be set, Davidson argues. O'Neill and Reed look past Davidson. A silhouette, a big silhouette. They slowly start to raise their weapons. What in the hell do you two think you're doing? Davidson yells as he draws his sidearm. You two maggots. Edwards takes five steps back towards O'Neill and Reed. Davidson, look, Edward says, pointing at the huge shadow behind them. Davidson slowly turns. A growl comes from the darkness, those burning orange eyes peering at the men. Davidson fires on the monster. The midnight black dogman roars. He bursts forward and grabs Davidson by his chest, smashing him into a tree. The three men look on in horror. In a flash, the dogman turns, with Davidson in his giant clawed hand. Bullets fly at the beast. They seem to just absorb into his flesh. The monstrosity grabs Davidson by his head, ripping Davidson in two. Blood, guts, and bones hit the ground in a wet splat. The men turn and run for their lives. The midnight dogman lets out another roar in victory. She watches two of the creatures run underneath her and her mate's perch. She looks at her mate. He leaps from the tree towards the two men. She quickly follows. The thrill of the hunt. They move down the tree limbs to the forest floor. Before hitting the ground, they push off of the massive trunk, flying through the trees, leaping off boulders, and crashing through small trees. The humans are in sight. The fear coming from them is intoxicating. Her icy blue eyes narrow, and she reaches for one of the humans' backs. How did she miss? She feels wet. It's hard for her to breathe. Reed lets off a burst of 556. Five, the bullets exit through those icy blue eyes. She drops to the forest floor. He roars in anger. Reed turns and drops to a knee, squeezing the trigger down. He dashes behind trees. Pieces of wood, leaves, and dust are flying through the moonlight. He turns on a dime, using his claws to pivot and darts towards the human. Reed, Edwards yells. Edwards empties his mag at the beast and blood sprays against the trees. He turns and glares at the two humans. 
his fur stained red, blood running down his muzzle. The two men raise their weapons and unload on the monster. The gunfire is deafening. The two men exhale. Damn, that was intense, Reed says. The small trees uprooted as the midnight dogman came plowing through them. The two men quickly raise their weapons and fire. Again, gunshots fill the air. With his enormous moor, he bites down on one human, tearing his leg away. Edward screams in pain. No, Reed yells. The huge dogman comes down on Edwards with his claws, slashing the flesh from his face, bone and tissue protruding. The dogman sprints at Reed. He leaps through the air, opening his massive moor full of dagger-like fangs. Reed rolls to the side, turns and fires. Fiery, lead sinks into the beast's side. It howls in pain. He turns and begins his attack again. Reed raises his M4. Click. Click. Fuck. Reed pulls his knife as the beast collides into him. Reed smashes his blade into the eye of the beast and blood pours from its socket. The dogman growls with rage. Come on, you son of a bitch. Fuck you. Reed yells as he continues to stab the beast. One final swing as the massive jaws close around Reed's neck. His fangs sink into the human's flesh as the blade penetrates his brain. Blood pools around the two warriors laying bloody and broken on the cold forest floor. Oh shit, Neil says as he continues running blind through the woods. The gunshots had stopped. The loud roars had stopped. Someone or something had lost. O'Neill thought. Suddenly, O'Neill's foot gets hooked on a root sticking from the ground. He tumbles down the hill. Splash. He lands belly down into the stream. O'Neill sits up and looks around. Well, ain't this a fucked up situation? Where's my gun? He fumbles around, looking for his M4. Fuck, O'Neill says. He pulls his 40 caliber from his holster checks the mag. Okay, at least I have you, O'Neill says to his pistol. He looks up at the moon, shining brightly in the sky. Wow, if I wasn't in this shithole, this would be awesome. O'Neill searches his pockets and he finds it. His sat phone. He begins to dial. Holy shit. O'Neill spins around, scanning his surroundings. Another howl comes from straight ahead of him. He clicks on the flashlight attachment on his 40 cal and shines it in the direction of the howl. He begins to walk, and he can hear something big shadowing his movements. This goes on for a bit. O'Neill rounds a bend and sees it. The cave, he says out loud. He cautiously approaches the entrance. Oh no. Harold. O'Neill's light hits his companion's headless body and vomit spews from his mouth as he hunches over. No, no. He composes himself as a deep guttural growl comes from within the cave. A behemoth of a dogman comes walking out from the darkness on all fours. Its eyes glowed bright like the sun, the fur reddish. It growls deeply. O'Neill can see his light reflecting off of the dogman's fangs. The beast stands effortlessly on two legs. It snarls and drool drips from his mouth. O'Neill stares in horror. The beast has a scar from its right ear to its lower jaw, no doubt from a fight with one of its kind. The dogman stands square with O'Neill, its back slightly arched, claws spread open, teeth bared. O'Neill quickly looks around. He sees another small alcove in the rocks. I have to get there. That thing is way too big to fit, O'Neill says to himself. He runs as the monster charges him. The dogman swipes at him, claws extended. 
O'Neill dives over the beast's massive arm and rolls as he hits the ground. He gains his feet and sprints to the alcove. He can feel the ground shake beneath his feet as the beast is almost on top of him, rotten breath on his neck. O'Neill dives into the alcove. The dogman smashes into the rock face. Small stones and dust fall onto O'Neill. The beast growls in frustration. It continues to swipe, trying to tear O'Neill from his hiding space. His eyes narrow at the human. He roars in anger as he smashes his fist into the rocks. He looks around. There. He leaps to the top of a rock, then jumps to another. Oh, shit. It can get in through the top, O'Neill says as he looks up and sees the moonlight. He thinks quickly. He reaches down to his belt and unhooks a grenade and pulls the pin as the beast drops down into the space. O'Neill dives from the alcove as he throws the grenade. The dogman lands hard on the rocky ground. O'Neill runs as fast as his legs will carry him. The grenade explodes. Rock and blood fly through the air. O'Neill hits the deck. Rocks fly past him. The dust settles and O'Neill stands. That's how you fucking do it. Fuck yeah. His words echo and O'Neill laughs. laughs. That was crazy. He kneels down by the stream. Crisp water pools into his cupped hands. He splashes the water onto his face. O'Neill stands and begins to walk in the direction of his vehicle. That was quite the adventure. I need to get home. Let the boys know the threat has been neutralized. Then shower and go be with my girl. O'Neill laughs and sings to himself as he walks back to the vehicles. Death stains the air. His pack is gone. He growls. He focuses as he sniffs. Again and again. There, the stench of humans. He looks towards his den, then bounds towards the direction the human went. O'Neill makes it to the vehicles. He gets in the driver's side door. Keys, keys, keys. Ah, got them. He grabs the keys and inserts them into the ignition and turns the key. O'Neill backs up and turns around, heading in the direction away from this terrible place. Stone. It's O'Neill. The team is gone. I'm the only survivor. What the fuck, O'Neill? Stone says. The whole team is wiped out. So are the dogmen. O'Neill says with excitement. That's good news. Any sign of Matt Lindale and Dale Cunnings? Negative, O'Neill replied. Oh well, that's unfortunate. I'll inform their partners. His strong muscles ripple as he moves through the forest, smashing through anything in his path. This human was not getting away. He sees the dust cloud from behind the vehicle, gaining ground. Oh, shit. What? Stone says. I got one chasing me. It's catching up. O'Neill, you must kill that dogman. Stone, this thing is fucking massive, O'Neill said. I don't fucking care. You complete the contract or the deal is off. Stone yells into the phone. Fuck, O'Neill yells as he throws the phone into the passenger seat. He is in range to attack. He leaps through the air, his massive frame landing onto the roof of the vehicle. He slams his claws into the metal to secure a grip. O'Neill slams on the brakes. The Alpha tumbles from the vehicle, hitting the ground. He rolls to his feet. He composes himself as he shakes his head back and forth. O'Neill slams on the gas, barreling towards the beast. His amber eyes narrow as the human speeds towards him. He sidesteps and grabs the frame of the driver's side door. In one motion, he rips the driver's side door from its hinges. 
He roars as glass flies through the inside of the vehicle. A piece slices through O'Neill's cheek. O'Neill reaches for his 40 caliber as the dogman's hand grabs his midsection. O'Neill screams as his claws pierce his flesh. The Alpha pulls the human from the vehicle, and he leaps through the air. The truck smashes into a huge tree and bursts into flames. The Alpha smashes the human into the hard ground. O'Neill's breath leaves his lungs. Blood pours from the holes in his sides. The Alpha bites down at O'Neill's face. O'Neill quickly grabs a log and shoves it between the beast's jaws. The Alpha clamps down on the log with immense force. It bursts to dust. O'Neill pulls his knife and shoves the blade deep into the Alpha's chest. The Alpha backs up and roars. Grasping the blade, he pulls the knife from his flesh and stares at the human. O'Neill gains his feet as he stares back into the Alpha's amber eyes. O'Neill quickly grabs a flare from his vest and pulls the top. A bright red light fills the area. O'Neill throws the flare and turns to run. He doesn't get far as the Alpha grabs the back of his camel pack. O'Neill screams as he spun through the air. O'Neill unclips his camel pack and hits hard into the ground, rolling several feet. Ah, fuck. O'Neill says, as he tries to gain his feet, O'Neill looks up expecting the beast to be right on top of him. However, the Alpha was nowhere to be seen. O'Neill stands up and pulls his 40 caliber. He scans the bright red surroundings. Nothing? What the fuck? O'Neill clicks the light on his flashlight. He shines it on the ground, looking for any sign of the massive beast. O'Neill yells out. Come out, you son of a bitch. You motherfucker. The Alpha, crouching in the brush, his lips curling back, fangs bared. He stares at the human, his chest throbbing from the blade that pierced under his rib, missing his heart by inches, the blood oozing from the wound. He needs to finish this quickly. O'Neill lets off another three shots. Bullets are flying at the Alpha. One zips past his head, another hits his shoulder as the other grazes the top of his head. The Alpha lets out a guttural growl. He burst forward at the human. O'Neill drops to a knee and raises his weapon, taking aim at the beast. He takes a breath and squeezes the trigger. The Alpha smashes into the ground hard as blood sprays from his neck. His gray fur stained crimson red. The Alpha glares at the human. A low growl escapes his moor. O'Neill stands over the monstrous dogman. He aims his 40 caliber at the dogman's forehead. Just then, a howl from the darkness. O'Neill looks up. The Alpha bites down hard on O'Neill's leg. O'Neill screams out in pain and squeezes the trigger multiple times. Blood, skull fragments, and brain pour from the gaping hole in the Alpha's head. O'Neill lays on his back. He sits up and stares at the massive corpse of the Alpha Dogman. He then assesses his leg, blood pouring from the bite marks. O'Neill takes his shirt off and ties it tight around his leg. He then removes some 350 paracord from his belt and uses it to secure the shirt around his leg. He screams as he tightens the cord. O'Neill takes a deep breath and gets to his feet. He looks at the blood-driven chaos around him. He turns and begins his slow journey through the silence of the forest to the other SUV. The morning sun is beginning to rise, fresh dew forming on the grass birds beginning to chirp, and insects beginning to crawl. A spider begins to consume a moth that got caught in its web earlier, and a deer drinking water from the stream. The last hoots of an owl fading away. O'Neill is approaching the SUV. He lets out a sigh as he climbs into the vehicle. He looks around and grabs the sat phone from the dashboard. He dials stone. 
Neil, Stone says. Is that you? Yes, Stone. It's me. I'm fucked up. I'm heading to the closest emergency room, says O'Neill. I don't give a fuck about that. What happened with the dogmen? They're dealt with, O'Neill said. I'm heading to the ER to get patched up, and then coming to collect my money. I'll see you in a few hours. O'Neill hangs up the phone and drives towards the nearest hospital over four hours away. As O'Neill is entering the hospital, Stone and King pull up to Aaron Lance's home. The two men exit the vehicle and approach the home. Lisa flings the door open and yells for Aaron. Aaron, those two werewolf hunters are back. King and Stone glance at each other. Werewolf hunters? King says. The two men pass smirks. Aaron joins Lisa at the door. What's happening? Did you find them? Aaron asks, her eyes welling up with tears. Ladies, we have some information. May we come in? Asks Stone. No way, says Aaron. Tell us what the hell is going on. Our team was wiped out, except for one man. The threat has been neutralized. As for your partners, I apologize, but there was no sign of them, King says. Erin drops to her knees as the tears fall from her eyes. Lisa tries to comfort her friend while crying herself. We're sorry for your loss, ladies, King says. The two men head towards their vehicle and drive away. Damn it, I really hate those talks. Aaron and Lisa continue to cry while hugging each other. O'Neill walks from the hospital with a cast around his leg. He has multiple puncture wounds, three broken ribs and a small fracture to his fibula. He gets into the SUV as he groans in pain. He reaches into his pocket he removes the bottle of painkillers and dumps four into his mouth and swallows as he puts the SUV in drive. He grabs the phone. I'll be there in 20 minutes, O'Neill said into the phone. 20 minutes later, O'Neill pulls in front of a small office building. He exits the vehicle, heads towards the building. The security guard at the door opens the door for O'Neill as he walks by. O'Neill enters the elevator and presses number five. A few moments pass and the elevator door opens. O'Neill steps into the office. King, Stone and Jones are sitting around a table. O'Neill, you fucking savage. Good to see you in one piece, Stone says. Cut the shit, Stone. Give me my money, O'Neill replies. Stone removes a bag from under the table and hands it to O'Neill. There you go, my friend. O'Neill grabs the bag and turns towards the elevator. O'Neill, are you sure all the black dogs were taken care of? King says in a raised voice. I hope so. O'Neill replies as the elevator doors close. He slowly walks through the forest. The smell of death and blood hits his nose. He leaps over a stone and sees a giant mass on the ground, the putrid odor of death strong in the air. A wet feeling under his feet, he looks down to see the crimson red of blood soaking his feet. He continues forward as he comes to the giant mass. He sniffs deeply and lets out a whimper. He then nudges his muzzle against the wet fur of his mother as he whimpers again. He climbs onto her, snuggling against her chest. He stands to his four-foot height, throws back his head, and lets out a howl. He brings his head down as he picks up another smell. Human. He lifts his head as his icy blue eyes narrow. He lets out a deep growl. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Descent into the Unknown for more terrifying stories.